Okay, hi, I'm going to mute the line. So can you unmute yourself when it comes to time? Thanks, Harlan. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Scottsdale Big Book Study, where we will study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Maria F, and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I'm from County Dublin in Ireland, and I am your host for today's study. Our co-hosts today are Nancy J, Sue L, and Audrey N. If you have any questions or any concerns during the meeting, please contact either myself or any of the co-hosts, and you can do this by private message in the chat function. Please note that the speaker today, Harlan G, will be recorded for the duration of the study. However, the question and answer session which follows, that will not be recorded. So please feel free to ask Harlan any questions you have when it comes to our Q&A. And we will put a link to the previous week's recordings in the chat function. We are currently on week number 105. We've got 104 previous recordings on YouTube. You can access all the other weeks there. We'll post a link for that now in a few minutes. We ask that if you could please make sure that your microphone is on mute at all times during today's study. And also please turn off your video if you are exercising, eating, or if indeed you need to step away from the screen for any, re any reason. Um, we also ask that you refrain from using the chat function during the meeting, just so that we can all be in attendance and present with each other here today. So now we will turn over the meeting to Scottsdale, Arizona, to Harlan. Good morning, Harlan. Good morning, Maria. Thank you. I'm just so happy to see everyone here this morning. It's wonderful. Uh, I hope it's as gorgeous and beautiful where you are, whether you're listening on a podcast or you're listening live as it is here in Scottsdale this morning. It's it's a beautiful summer day in Arizona. It's going to be well into the 100s, but it's a beautiful, beautiful day. So glad to be here. Just a little bit of a reminder that two weeks from today, now next week we are here, two weeks from today we're not here because I'm going to Flagstaff, Arizona, and in Flagstaff, Arizona, we're going to do a live workshop for three days, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. So uh, on the 23rd of July, I will not be doing this forum uh, of Big Book, but then we will be back on the 30th of July, God willing, and we'll be ready to tackle whatever comes our way. Um, we've been working on getting some younger people in the meeting, and I want to welcome Carl from Sweden. Carl is joining us today, and Carl is one of our youngest members. He is a very, very uh, enthusiastic member of OA, and he very seldom misses a session of the big book. And he's just like his daddy. His daddy puts his hand up to his face, and so does Carl, very, very much like his daddy. So I just want Carl to represent the younger people in OA today. So he is, he is with us again today, and we want to welcome him. He's very cute. Anyway, um, we have been in the chapter uh, more about alcoholism. And in the chapter, more about alcoholism, we are visiting, and there is another one of our younger people. We have with us Ilsa, and she is with us today. And uh, Elsa is, is also one of our younger members, and Elsa and Carl are in Sweden. So the, the drive to get them in earlier is working. Be encouraged that it is working. So we're, we're here. Okay. And if you're not wearing a Dodgers jersey, then you are more than welcome to stay among us. If you are, of course, then someone might think you're out of your mind. But anyway, we're studying chapter three. And in the chapter, more about alcoholism, we have been talking about Fred. And we know that Fred is sort of from the other side of what we normally think of as an alcoholic. And the reason that Fred is very important as a story is many of us think that alcoholics lay in the gutter and wear trench coats or that compulsive overeater and drink out of what is it they put the bag over the bottle or something. This is what we think sometimes in our mind. 
but alcoholics and compulsive overeaters look as varied as the 98 or the 100 people that are here today. We, there's no profile of who is or is not what we look like. We're black, we're white, we're, we're, we're tall, we're short, we're Pacific Rim, we're South American, we're whatever we are. We are compulsive overeaters and we come in various shapes and various sizes, but we also come from various socioeconomic backgrounds. We don't all come from the same. We're not homo, uh, we're not homo uh, geneus. We're, we're very, we're varied in our social economic backgrounds, in our religions, in our beliefs, there is no profile. And so when we think of the alcoholic, we don't normally think of someone like Fred, he, who is a partner in a well-known accounting firm, yet he is alcoholic. And in the in the paragraph that we're going to start with today, we're going to start just to let you know, we're going to start on page 40. I'm going to kind of catch us up again, but we're going to start on page 40 and we're going to start with the paragraph at the bottom of 40 that starts with in this frame of mind. But I just want to kind of remind you of some of the things that we have been emphasizing in chapter three, more about alcoholism, because it's very, very important for us to remember it. And how do we remember it best? By teaching it incessantly to others. Remember that it says in the big book, nothing ensures immunity. What a great promise, the word immunity. Nothing ensures immunity from compulsive overeating like intensive work with other compulsive overeaters. Very, very important for us to keep that in mind. So we're, we're going to remember it best when we transmit it. And remember what Clancy Immeslin taught us. Clancy was a member of AA, but he did a lot of work in early, early OA in the Los Angeles area, helping Roseanne by speaking at some of their meetings because the OA people had never worked steps. They weren't exposed to this kind of thing. And Clancy was one of those people that spoke at the meetings and gave Roseanne a lot of help by doing so because he educated a lot of people. And he's one of my favorite circuit speakers was Clancy. And he said, that you don't get this program by absorbing spiritual information, you get this program by transmitting spiritual information. Very, very important. Now, just looking at the chapter again, because we're getting close to finishing it. I don't know that we'll finish it today. I don't know that we won't, but let's just see how far we get. I'm not going to rush anything, but let's just take a look at the chapter and at the very first page of the chapter, page 30, we are told that we're told step one. And what we're taught in step one on page 30 is we learned that we had a fully concede to our, we had a fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. So this is very important for me to remember. And that is, why do I say at every meeting that I go to, hi, I'm Harlan, I'm a compulsive overeater. Do I say it so you'll know that? No, you couldn't care less. The reason that I say that at every meeting is so I won't forget it. So I will know that I am a compulsive overeater. And because I have that meeting, the meetings that I go to where I say that because I have that constant reminder, it helps me stay alive because the minute I forget that I am a compulsive overeater, the food will seep back into my life in a very violent way and remind me and it will drag me through pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. The disease is a good teacher. It teaches me how vicious it is. It teaches me how merciless it is. It teaches me how lack of mercy this disease is because it has done things to me that I wouldn't do to my worst enemy. It has degraded me. It has made me fat. 
It has embarrassed me. It has ruined my health. It has made me an object of ridicule and it has made me hate myself. It has made me feel apart from the world instead of a part of the world. It made it difficult for me to walk. It made it impossible for me to live a life that was a life that was worth living. And so this disease shattered my dreams. This disease shattered my life. And it affected adversely the lives of anybody close to me. Now, the reason that I repeat that over and over again is because I have a part of my brain that is a built-in forgetter. Remember that the mental twist has a sidekick. And the sidekick to the mental twist is the mental blank spot. When I am angry, scared, jealous, happy, when I'm feeling whatever it is I'm feeling, I could be standing in front of a bag of Chips Ahoy cookies. I could be standing in front of God knows what that I know I shouldn't be eating. And I will convince myself that this time it's going to be okay. This time, maybe I won't gain so much weight. And then my favorite of all the narishkeit, narishkeit means foolishness in Yiddish, all of the narishkeit that my mental blank spot will try to convince me of, it will try to convince me that this time is going to be okay because tomorrow I'm going to go back on my diet. Tomorrow I'm going to be good rather than bad. I'm going to be legal rather than illegal. I'm going to be okay rather than sick. And that's not the worst part. The worst part isn't that my brain will tell me that. The worst part is, is that in the face of every piece of evidence to the contrary, my brain will believe it. My brain will believe that my life will not be ruined by those cookies, by that candy, by that pe whatever it is you like to binge on, these are the things I like to binge on. And when I do, I am never able to control the amount I eat once I get started, no matter how sincere my promise to myself, no matter how sincere I am to my own self, I will eat amounts way beyond anything I even could have imagined. And my bottoms all have trap doors. As bad as I think a bottom might look, as nightmarish as I think a bottom will look, it will always, always be worse. And as we go through chapter three, we learn again and again, through the man of 30, through Jim, through Fred, through the jaywalker, that the disease has two characteristics and three traits. The two characteristics are taught to us by Dr. Silkworth. What are the two characteristics? An allergy of the body and a twist of the mind. Now, what do we learn from Peabody, Richard Peabody wrote a book in 1930. It was published in 30. I didn't used to spit when I talked. I don't know if this is me getting old or me getting crazy or both. I don't know. All of a sudden I'm spitting. But anyway, um, what do we learn from Peabody? What is it that we learn in this chapter from the book called The Common Sense of Drinking? That the disease has three characteristics. The characteristics of the disease are, it is permanent. It is permanent. So that if I am a compulsive overeater, I will never not be a compulsive overeater. I know that's an improper sentence, but I like, I like the, the verbiage of it to describe me. I will never not be a compulsive overeater. The disease is permanent. You know that sentence in the big book, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic? We learn that from Peabody. Now, what is the second of these characteristics? And the second of these characteristics is one of the least 
understood by many people, and that is the disease is progressive. What does that mean, progressive? It means that over time, as I age, the disease will get worse and worse and worse and worse. And abstinence does not treat the disease. I'm going to say that again because it's very important and it can be counterintuitive to some of the things that we hear and say at meetings all the time. Abstinence does not treat the disease. Man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. He decided he was going to do no drinking until he was successful in business. He remained bone dry for 25 years. He picked up, a, his, uh, out came his carpet slippers in a bottle. He was dead within four years. So for 25 years, he was bone dry, did not touch a drop of liquor. Did his abstinence treat his illness? No, it did not. And so even though he was bone dry for an extended period of time, the abstinence, the sobriety that he enjoyed did not beat back the negative effects of his alcoholism. And what is the other thing that a man of 30 tells us, teaches us, that the disease, if unchecked, is fatal. So it's permanent, progressive, and fatal. And if you've ever seen a person like me who left, and a lot of us do, but I can only talk about myself. I came, I left, I came back, I left again, I came, I stayed. When I left, and I picked up that food. I never picked it up from the point where I left it off. I was always worse. And what else do I know? I know this because of my mother. My mother died of this disease. At the time that mom died, she was a dialysis patient. She had had her leg amputated because of her diabetes, her compulsive overeating, her circulation was extremely poor. And my mother was an amputee. She got gangrene in her lower calf and they had to amputate her leg at the knee. And they were telling me that they were probably going to have to take the other leg, but she mercifully died before they had to take the other leg. And when I say mercifully, I don't mean I'm glad she died, but I'm very glad my mom didn't have to suffer a second amputation. I was very glad that she didn't have to suffer the, the, uh, the, the horrible, horrible process of, of having another leg amputated. So she mercifully died. I'm not saying I'm glad she died. So don't misunderstand me. I'm glad she didn't have to suffer like that. That was a horrible, horrible ordeal in her life. The disease is permanent. The disease is progressive. The disease is fatal. And as we look at the jaywalker and we look at all these stories, the disease gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, never better, better, better. Now the recovery is also progressive. It, it keeps getting better. The harder I work at my recovery, the better it gets because I won't go into a whole thing here, but I will at some point, but I want to get to the chapter. As I recover, now when I first came in here, and I would say for the first five to six years that I was back after my last relapse, all I could really see was the scale and the, and the clothing sizes. And that was the barometer of my recovery, the scale and clothes, the scale and clothes. As I started to progress in my recovery, I started liking myself more. I started being able to speak my mind more. I, excuse me, I said yes when I meant yes, and no, when I meant no, I became a better friend to myself. And I started liking me more. I started being who I was meant to be. I didn't try to figure out, do you want me to be a Republican? Do you want me to be a Democrat? Do you want me to like 
blue? Do you want me to like red? I mean, where are you? And whatever it is you want me to be and like and do and dislike, I'll do that so you won't run away from me. And I've learned in recovery that whether you stay or whether you go, it's okay. That God is here and all is well. I don't want you to abandon me. I don't want you to leave me, but that's okay if that's if this is as far as our path goes, then I wish you well. And I can separate from you without rancor. I can separate from you without trying to burn your village to the ground, if you know what I'm talking about. And there's other things too, like I can look at the world and understand that I am part of it. I'm not better than you. I'm not worse than you. I'm not a victim. I'm not some victim of the world. And not everybody's out to get me. Not everybody's out to hurt me. It's not, I don't have to don my sword and my shield every morning and go out there and do battle with the world because they're, you know, I don't have to do that. I'm just another child of God. I'm just another bozo on the bus. And that is so emancipating just to be another bozo on the bus. And there's more to this. We'll get into it another time. But let's go to the bottom of page 40 at where it says in this frame of mind. But just remember, there are many, many vital things that we learn from this chapter. And the three things we learn from the chapter, just to encapsulate permanent progressive, fatal if unchecked. Let's go to the bottom of 40 and let's look in on uh, Fred because we're still talking about Fred and let's take a look at what we see here. He's been drinking. He went to, uh, he went on a business trip and he wanted to get, he didn't want to get drunk, but he got drunk. Let's see in the forensic analysis of what Fred did, because this is where we're at, is in the forensic analysis of him getting drunk. Bottom of 40, join me if you can. In this frame of mind, I went about my business for a time. Oh, in what frame of mind? In the frame of mind, I'm sorry, I should have covered this. My bad, my bad. That they had been, he had been approached by members of Alcoholics Anonymous and they told him what they knew of alcoholism about the physical allergy and the twist of the mind. And then they told him the solution that they had. I should have covered this, I'm sorry. The solution was the spiritual recovery. And he didn't want it. He didn't take step one. He didn't take step two. He listened to what they said. And, you know, he just kind of, eh, I don't know. I'm not that bad. I can handle it myself. You ever hear say that to yourself? I'm just going to handle it myself. I know I sure have. And you know what? My record at handling it myself is abysmal. It's absolutely abysmal. Let's go to the bottom of 40. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard work of a simple matter. In other words, he's on his pink cloud. He's on that pink cloud. He's on a diet. He's not drinking. He figures what these guys were talking about was just foolish, just narish kite. It doesn't apply to him. He can apply his self-discipline and he cannot drink. It's no problem. Let's see where he goes from there. Remember, permanent Permanent, progressive, fatal, permanent, progressive, fatal. Let's see where we go. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. Now, you have to be a very special kind of, of, of like a CPA or an attorney to plead before the IRS, which is where, where he's uh, pleading. I had been out of town before during this particular dry spell. So there was nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. So let's take a stop, look and listen right here for just a minute, because I want to point out how different this scenario is from the scenarios that we imagine ourselves 
binging in. We always imagine or usually imagine ourselves binging when things go poorly for us. Maybe a loved one is sick. Maybe we've lost somebody that we love. Maybe a pet, maybe a relative, a friend, a lover, whatever that may be. And so we say, well, when this happened, I went back into the food. But the food can attack the disease, not the food. The disease can attack when things go well as readily as it can attack when things go poorly. Because when things go well, I get this swelled up ego. I get this feeling of invincibility. I get this feeling that everything's going to continue going well. So I can indulge a little bit in Doritos. I can indulge a little bit in, in, in uh, what do you call it, uh, donuts or, or Chips Ahoy or whatever. But the bottom line is, I can't. Let's find out what happened to him. Things are going well for him now. Everything's looking roses. I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner and go back to the hospital and get locked up. Oh, no, sorry. It doesn't say that. But he's been in the hospital before from drinking. So he must have figured that if he has a couple of cocktails with dinner, he's going to go back to the hospital. But remember, he has the mental blank spot, which absolutely does not allow his brain to remember that. And his brain is not focused in on what the food is going to do to, for, to him. He is only focused on what the food is going to do for him. It's, he's going to enjoy it. It's going to feel good. I'm going to eat a hot fudge sundae. I'm going to eat pizza. It's going to feel fantastic. We're all going to eat pizza. We're going to gain camaraderie and we're going to celebrate and we're going to tell jokes and boy, the pizza is going to be delicious. No, not for me. Not for me. Let's continue. <clears throat> have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. I ordered a cocktail and my meal. What caused Fred to order the first cocktail was the mental twist. And the mental twist was activated by the buildup of everyday human emotion. And we perceive sometimes that the emotions that build us to eating are fear and anger and jealousy and hurt feelings. Yes, those work very effectively. Chief defect activator is the selfishness when people don't stick to our script and resentment. Those are the number one offenders. But isn't happiness an, uh, an emotion? isn't accomplishment an emotion. I hate to tell you how many railroad cars full of chocolate turtles I have eaten because things went well for me. When things go well for me, unusually well, yes, I'm enjoying a role that I'm on, but I'm also vulnerable to food. And how do I ground myself with the same step 10 that I would use when things go poorly for me? And I must get out of myself. So we're seeing that the mental twist activated by that buildup of emotions is causing him to order a cocktail with his meal. No big deal. He's having a cocktail. He doesn't see himself strapped down in a hospital yet, but he will. Then I ordered another cocktail. What has he activated by ordering the first one? Oh, you're so smart. I can see some of you saying it. He has activated the allergy, the physical allergy. And in the activation of the physical allergy, that craving will place him above human aid. Now he's got it inside of him. Once that second cocktail is ordered, he is no longer operating on the mental twist. He is operating on the physical allergy because the first cocktail put the alcohol inside of him. He activated the allergy and the second cocktail has now been ordered. He is now at the mercy 
of his own disease. Let's see where he goes from there. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. What do you think he was thinking about on the walk? He was obsessing about more liquor. You can bet your bottom dollar that when he took that walk, it was only a, a matter of him taking the walk so he could convince himself that he was normal and that it was okay for him to go back into that bar and get sloshed. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed. So he has a highball before he goes to bed. I got to make a confession to you. I've been reading this book for many years. And when I was living in Eugene, Oregon, I got into recovery there. And that was fine. I got into recovery in 1998. And I was in Eugene, Oregon at that time. And I didn't know what a highball was. So they, they laughed and they explained it to me. I didn't know what the heck a highball even was. Okay. It struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed. So I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty next morning. He's got it inside himself now. He is at the mercy of the physical allergy. The cravings have set him apart and put him beyond human aid. He is no longer able to control his consumption of liquor. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxi cab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. His wife probably took his call and all of a sudden she said, you're drunk. Don't, you know, I'm not coming to pick you up. You're drunk. So he finds a taxi driver. The driver escorted me about for several days. What do you think he was doing with the taxi driver for several days? He was getting further and further drunk because he can no longer resist the urge to drink alcohol once that physical allergy has been manifested. I know little of where I went or what I said and did. Why is that? He's drunk. Then came the hospital with the unbearable mental and physical suffering. So no matter what happened, how good his trip to Washington was, how things went his way, everything was coming up roses. Everything was looking good. He's back in the hospital. He's strapped down. He is absolutely humiliated. His wife is now going to see that he's back in the hospital. His kids are going to see that he's back in the hospital. His business associates are going to see that he's back in the hospital. Would that knowledge prior to the first drink have made one difference? No, it would not because he knew it but the mental blank spot didn't allow him to remember it with sufficient force so as to dissuade him from taking the drink. The drink represented to him the freedom of the effect. And that effect, that sense of ease and comfort was what he had been looking for the entire time. He was looking for relief from the buildup of human emotion. Let's continue. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Here's italics. Remember that italics, this is not the first time that we've read italics today. Italics cost these guys more money than regular print and money was tough. This was the height of the depression. They needed money. They spent it on this. So pay attention. It says, not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. And how many times in my life did I wake up in the morning and swear to God and swear to whoever was there, my mother, my dad, whoever, I wasn't going to eat those little pecan pies. I wasn't going to eat Dolly Madison or Hostess. I wasn't going to eat whatever. You fill in the blank, whatever it is you like to binge on. 
And there it was. It was almost as if my automobile or my feet had minds of their own. And there I was going in and buying the one thing I swore to God I was not going to buy that day. And there I was eating it, swearing to God that tomorrow would be different. But for today, I might as well get good and drunk then. And I did. So I wasn't drunk. I'm just using Bill Wilson's words from when he goes into the cafe to make a telephone call. And now he's pounding on the bar, wondering how it happened. And he said to himself, I might as well get good and drunk then. And I did. And how many thousands of times from the age of five on did that happen to me? Many, many hundreds of times. One of the reasons that this is a disease of self-loathing is because I lied to myself and lied to myself and lied to myself and lied to myself in ways I would not have wanted to lie to you. So I treated myself in a very, very bad way. I did not treat myself as a friend. And while I was eating the food and while I was having diarrhea and while I was having gastric distress, I cursed myself for a weakling. I cursed myself as a jerk. And I said to myself in the mirror or not in the mirror, Harlan Grabowski, you must be stupid. You don't deserve to live. And I would speak to myself in a way that was very, very horrible. And my wife said to me one time, she said, oh my God, Harlan, if you spoke to your friends like you speak to yourself, would you have any? And I have to think that the answer was no, I would not. I would speak to myself like my worst enemy. Bottom of 41. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all. Why didn't he think of the consequences? Because of the mental blank spot. I had commenced to drink as carelessly as though the cocktails were ginger ale. This can't hurt me. I'm above this. I'm immune to this. I'm, I'm invulnerable. I'm, I'm me. I'm above this kind of thing. I now remembered what my alcoholic friends had told me, how they prophesied that if I had an alcoholic mind, the time and place would come, I would drink again. They had said that though I did raise a defense, it would one day give way before some trivial reason for having a drink. And that trivial reason can be as simple as it's my daughter's wedding, it's my friend's wedding, it's a bar mitzvah, it's a christening, it's a funeral. After all, it's my birthday, I have to have a piece of cake. I cannot tell you the number of times people have called me and they have eaten and they're calling me after long absences of not calling. And when you get right down to it, when you ask them what happened, they'll tell you, well, I was on a cruise. Well, I was at a hotel. Well, I was out to lunch. And my aunt baked special for me. She baked a sugar-free chocolate cake. And there was no sugar in it. And there was no this in it. And it was gluten-free. And it was this. And it was kosher. And it was that. And it was all these various things that they say. But the real truth is there's no reason to eat but there are often excuses that I will jump through because I really want to eat. And this is what happens again and again and again. Do you remember when we studied Bill's story? We talked about Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And I told you a story about Bill Wilson going to Cherry Hill, New Jersey on a business venture. And this is after he had decided that he didn't want to drink anymore. And he was going on what we would call diets. And there he was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Stocks were at a low point in 1932, and they had formed a group to buy, and they wanted Bill to head up this group and make some decisions on what stocks they would buy and what they wouldn't buy. 
and they respected Bill Wilson, but they were afraid that he was going to get drunk. And he assured them that indeed he was done drinking excessively and that this was not going to be the case. And a guy came to the hotel room in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Let me blow my nose. <sighs> ah. He came to the hotel room in Cherry Hill, New Jersey with a bottle of what he called Jersey Lightning. And if you remember the story, the bottle went around and there were a bunch of gentlemen in the room. The bottle went around and Bill didn't take any. The bottle came around again and the guy says, hey, Wilson, I made this myself. It's called Jersey Lightning. Why don't you have just one drink? Bill takes a drink, triggers the allergy, and he cannot walk out of that room for three days and the business venture vanished. Did Bill think about the first drink? He didn't know. He had never met Silkworth yet. Did he think that every single time I take the first drink, it leads to this? No, he didn't think at all. He just had the first drink. He didn't have any willpower because where alcohol is concerned, the will is amazingly weakened. And we learn these things. And when we go through Bill's story, a lot of times people say, well, I don't relate to this. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a white Christian man from Vermont. I'm not a stockbroker. I never lived in New York. And that's fine. I'm born and raised in Chicago. But the bottom line is, is that I relate to it. And if I look at the way Bill thinks that he can have one drink, and I look at the way he drinks because it led to a million, I relate right down the line. I don't have to stretch very much to relate to Bill Wilson. The way he thinks and the way he drinks are identical to the way I think and the way I eat. I don't have to really have much of an imagination to put myself in the scenario that he describes so eloquently in his story and the stories that are in chapter three of Fred, the jaywalker, a man of 30, and Jim. I don't have to stretch very hard. <sighs> okay, hang on one second. My facocta allergies are acting up, but not as bad as they were earlier in the week. They're much, much better. Okay. I have had since, okay. Quite as important was the discovery that, oh, wait a minute. I'm way ahead of myself here. Okay. I had not, I had learned of alcoholism. They, oh, they said though, I did raise a defense that would one day give way before some trivial reason of having, for having a drink. Well, that just, ugh. Just that did happen and more for what I had learned of alcoholism did not occur to me at all. I knew from that moment that I had an alcoholic mind. Sometimes it takes what it takes. You know what I'm thankful for this morning? There's 135 people here not named Harlan and me too, that no matter how vicious the storm that you walked through with this disease, you made it here. And in making it here, you've grabbed the life preserver that can save your life. This recovery does work. This recovery will work. If you work it, I saw that willpower and self-knowledge would not help in those strange mental blank spots. How true is that statement? I had never been able to understand people who said that a problem had them hopelessly defeated I knew then it was a crushing blow. This disease has me hopelessly defeated. I cannot beat this game, no matter how strong I am, no matter how smart I am, no matter how dumb I am, no matter how weak I am, if I'm male, female, black, white, green, yellow, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Mormon, if I'm Shinto, if I'm Buddhist, if no matter what the scenario might be, it doesn't matter. I'm human. 
It doesn't matter what I think, believe, or am. I'm human. And this disease places me above human aid. Very important for me to remember. Nothing human. Remember on page 60, it says B, that no human power could have relieved my compulsion. Ask John Candy. Ask Mama Cass Elliott. Ask Chris Farley, ask William Howard, Ta uh, Howard Taft, the president, ask Fatty Arbuckle, ask these people, Karen Carpenter, ask these people if their money helped them beat this disease. Oh, you can't, they're dead. But did their money help them beat this disease? No. Did their fame help them beat this disease? No. Did their talent help them beat this disease? No, no. President Taft was so morbidly obese, he couldn't get elected dog catcher now, he was over 300 pounds. He was so morbidly obese that he had to tear out at his own expense, the bathtub in the White House because he couldn't fit his butt into it. And he had to have a specially made bathtub come out from his home in Ohio. And that bathtub was the only bathtub that would allow him to bathe because he couldn't fit in the tub that was provided at the White House. Look at this disease as a terrorist. Look at this disease as a killer because this disease wants you dead. And it lies to you in ways that are so acutely believable. It reasons with you. It knows just what buttons to push with you. It knows how to convince you to eat what it wants you to eat and die the way it wants you to die. And it will choke off your life before it kills you. You will be isolated. You will be alone. And that's when the disease has you in its grip. If you're in that situation today and you're eating or you're thinking about eating, hear what I'm going to say. Reach out to us. Reach out to God. Work these steps. Don't try to willpower yourself across the bridge of reason to get to another side. It will not work. The only solution we have is a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. That's the only solution that we have. Stop trying to look for alternatives. They are not there. There is no alternative. There is no easier. This is the easier, softer way. Look at some of the faces that you see. Some of them are a joy to behold, because not because they're so physically beautiful, although some of you are, but because they're, it's the face of freedom. It's the face of recovery. It's the face of hope. It's the face of God. It's what happens to a person when recovery is in their heart. And the work that they're doing is bringing them every day closer to God and further away from the food, the disease. And the disease is more than food, more than food. It's self-loathing. It's, it's that feeling of fear, that feeling of dread that you have as you go out into the world. It's that feeling that everybody is better than you or everybody is worse than you. It's that miserable feeling you get in your heart when you're scared to death of everyday life. So grab onto one of us, grab onto the recovery. On page 88 of the big book, it says it works. It really does. Let's continue in the chapter. Two of the members, I'm on page 42. Two of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. They don't go alone. They always go in twos. They grinned, which I didn't like so much, and then asked me if I thought myself alcoholic. 
and if I were really licked this time. Step number one. My friend Barbara in Italy, she lives in Paris now, but she taught me how to say step one. It's passo prima. Passo prima in Italian is step one. They're talking about step one. I had to concede both propositions. So in other words, he's admitting that he's powerless over alcohol and his life is unmanageable. They piled on me heaps of evidence to the effect that an alcoholic mentality such as I had exhibited in Washington was a hopeless condition. What do they mean by hopeless? There's no hope as long as you hang on to your current ideology. Once you adopt an ideology that says, I'm powerless and I need help, step two, step one, step two, now you're on your way because you're gonna plug into the power that is the only power that is bigger and more powerful than your disease. The only power you have to tap into is that higher power. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. What book would I urge you never to read again? The Little Engine That Could. Don't read The Little Engine That Could. He goes up there and he says, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. No, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't. You are not gonna beat this on your own. I don't care what your scenario. You are not going to beat this on your own. Get used to that thought and that that's okay. We come from Western culture. And in Western culture, one of the things we deal with is this in inherent self-sufficiency. In Western culture, we are taught that we must be self-sufficient. We don't discuss our problems with anybody. We solve our own problems in this family, young lady. We solve our own problems in this family, young man. We don't do this and we don't get help. We find a way to discipline ourselves and we find a way to get willpower to overcome our problems. That's not possible here. Divorce yourself from that ideology. You must amputate that ideology from your psyche. You must, you must be dependent on a higher power. Guidance and dependence on a higher power. Guidance and dependence on a higher power. So critical to our survival, critical was a hopeless condition. They cited cases out of their own experience by the dozens. So these two guys from AA, they're talking about their life. They're not talking about his life. They're talking about their life. And this is how they sponsor. This is how we sponsor today. Hopefully the process, this process of them telling him his story snuffed out the last flicker of conviction, conviction that I could do the job myself. So what steps did we just cover quickly? One and two. One, the idea, I'm powerless over food, my life's unmanageable. And two, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Notice it doesn't say restore me to abstinence. Notice it doesn't say restore me to sobriety. It says, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Sane people don't despise themselves. Sane people don't treat pe themselves like we have treated ourselves. Sane people don't use their digestive system as a garbage can for junk food. Sane people don't starve themselves. Sane people don't restrict. Sane people don't use exercise bulimia or laxative bulimia or regurgitation bulimia, they just don't. And if you're suffering from these things, we have a solution for you. Come and join us, do the work and trudge this road of happy destiny with us. Let's continue. Then they outlined the spiritual answer and program of action, which a hundred of them had followed successfully. Very, very important. What do you first want to know when you came in here? 
does this work? Are there testimonials that speak to the fact that this is going to work? So some of you came in here and you didn't see that and you left. And that's an unfortunate thing. One of the things that is so important is for us to see recovery. And I know some of you live in big cities like Los Angeles, and some of you live in Chicago, and some of you live in New York, and some of you live, you know, God knows where. And you can see recovery because the meetings are big and they're healthy. But there's people who live in small towns and they go to these meetings and there's three, four, five people there when we were just live and, and they didn't see a lot of recovery. And that can be very, very discouraging. One of the things I'm very grateful to God for is in the midst of the pandemic, he brought us together electronically in a way that I myself could never have dreamed of. What a miracle this is. And again, I'm going to pitch you on something that I want you to, to, to do. I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to try. I want you to do it. The OA birthday is coming up in January. The 13th, 14th, and 15th of January is the OA birthday. It's live. It's big. It's in person. It's in Los Angeles, California. And it's going to be at the LAX Hilton. And this birthday is going to be a convention that there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of people in various stages of recovery, and you will be able to join us in the safety of knowing that this is an OA environment. We're not going to judge you. We're just going to love you. I don't care if you're overweight. I don't care if you're underweight. Come join us. All we want to do is love on you. And when you go to the workshops, and there will be many, go to the workshops, you're going to hear recovery, and you're going to share the recovery with people who are in various stages of recovery too. And you will make friends, and you will enjoy yourself. And hopefully, it will be something that will awaken something inside of you that when you're in that journey back to your house, whether you live in Los Angeles and that journey is a short car ride or a long car ride or that journey like I am going to is a plane ride or wherever it is you live, you're going to say to yourself and do it that you're going to up your game in terms of recovery. There's gonna be so much at this birthday that is gonna help so many people be in the crowd that it is going to help. You're going to love it. We haven't been live in a couple of years and it's really about time that we laugh together and we cry together and we dance together and we smile together and we hug one another if that's what you want. If you don't want, that's fine too. And that we hear each other and see each other because life is short. And this will be a wonderful opportunity for all of us to get to know each other just a little bit, just a little bit better. Let's continue. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Though I had been only a nominal churchman, their proposals were not intellectually hard to swallow, but the program of action, though entirely sensible, was pretty drastic. And then I would have to throw several lifelong conceptions out the window. What's the number one conception that I have to throw out the window? The number one conception is that I can do this by myself. I cannot. That was not easy, but the moment I made up my mind to go through with the process, step three, I had the curious feeling that my alcoholic condition was relieved as in fact, it proved to be. So we're gonna stop there, but before I turn it over, I'm gonna write down where we are for next week. We're on page 42. I'm, I'm gonna say some things to you before we go quite as important. Okay, now, before I turn this